Good or good afternoon, depending on your location. I'm Drew Clark at Curtin McConkie. We will start the webinar in one minute's time and look forward to uh, a great discussion. So one more minute and we'll begin. Good afternoon or good morning again, and thank you for joining the Curtin McConkie webinar on the subject of how to build your gigabit network. Uh, I'm Drew Clark of Council of Curtin McConkie. I'm joined by David Shaw, shareholder at Curtin McConkie, and we have a great group of panelists here that we will turn to and introduce in just a moment. Uh, before we begin, though, I wanted to remind everyone that this is the first of four webinars that we will be conducting uh, same time, same location. Just come back to this link uh, next week at this time and we'll discuss our, our next uh, topic on how to build your gigabit network. And we'll talk more about that later in our hour-long webinar. Um, we will take questions and answers through the chat feature on the webinar, so we invite you to make them. We've already received dozens of questions. And as a result, we won't get to all of them but we will uh, be getting to as many as we can. And of course, since this is the first of four, we hope we'll be able to get to your question at a succeeding webinar. Finally, we are recording this as well as the PowerPoint presentations, so you should be able to access this at, at a later date, and we hope you will uh, return to it. Uh, without any further ado, let me turn to my partner, David Shaw. Thanks for being with us, David, and why don't you lay out the landscape for us. Thank you, Drew, and welcome, everybody. Um, and we're so excited to have you all on board for uh, the first of uh, uh, this four-part series on how to build your gigabit network. Uh, the gigabit revolution is spreading across the nation, as many of you are aware, uh, and uh, is, has recently been recognized by the White House. Uh, and the federal government has taken has has awakened itself to the fact that municipal broadband is out there, but it's not just municipal broadband; it's every kind of gigabit network uh, uh, conceivable. Uh, and so, as as I've worked throughout my career, I've come across uh, three keys that are really fundamental to the success of a gigabit network, particularly in the municipal context. Uh, and uh, those keys are um, the, the political heroism uh, is number one. Uh, projects that don't have political heroes uh, tend to die over time. Uh, and those that don't sustain their political heroes uh, as champions of the gigabit network uh, tend to uh, lose their uh, luster. Uh, and, and it becomes very difficult to maintain the support of the citizenry. Uh, and then secondly, uh, projects, in order to be successful, must have the legal capacity to exist. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time working in a variety of states and, and even internationally to some degree um, trying to figure out how to make gigabit networks in the municipal context uh, successful from a legal perspective. Uh, and, and these. These problems come about in a variety of contexts, whether it's constitutional limitations, statutory limitations, uh, or, or otherwise. Uh, and, and so it's fundamental that if that capacity doesn't exist, it's very difficult to have that project. And then uh, finally, uh, of my three keys to success is the ability to successfully finance the network. Uh, you may have legal capacity, but if you don't have the ability to raise the money, 
uh, to build the network, then it's very, very difficult. And there are a variety of funding sources uh, that we will um, uh, hopefully touch upon in future webinars. So we would encourage you to come back at, at, at a future date to hear more about that. Uh, and so without further ado, um, and those three keys uh, of success in our world, um, we'll uh, uh, now turn to our, our panelists. So I'll turn it over to Drew uh, again to make some introductions. Thanks, David. Um, obviously, now is a time of great interest in gigabit networks, in uh, municipal and community broadband. Uh, one of the organizations that has been tracking this uh, before it became a sexy topic is Broadband Communities, the magazine. Uh, we have on the line here Masha Vegar, who is the editor of Broadband Communities, and uh, she's going to lay out for us uh, an overview of this topic. But I do want to make sure everyone on this call is well aware of the Broadband Community Summit that Broadband Communities Magazine hosts every April. It will be in Austin, Texas. Uh, David Shaw and myself will be there along with, of course, many of you. It is the watering hole for this industry. So, Masha, go ahead and give us the overview that you prepared for us, please. Okay. Hi, and thank you, Drew, for that nice introduction. Uh, as the first speaker and the first webinar in this series, I get the privilege of giving you the big picture of community broadband networks. Uh, as Drew mentioned, we've been tracking municipal fiber to the home networks for about a decade, and I think have uh, most, if not all of them, listed. Um, the other speakers are going to give you lots of details about what to do and what not to do, and I'm going to try to offer a wider perspective on the subject. Okay, in, uh, can we have the next slide? Okay, so the first question is how many municipal networks are there, uh, and, and that really depends on how you ask, uh, how you define them and how you ask the question. Um, by our count, in the, in the United States there are 136 currently municipal fiber networks. Um, not all of those are all fiber. Some of them are fiber to businesses and cable or wireless to, um, to residents or others. Uh, there, there are also 11 public-private fiber networks, and again, uh, that depends on how you're counting it. There, that does not include things like Google, where the uh, where the localities are significantly involved, but only includes uh, networks where both public and private party have significant ownership and control of the of the network. Then. In addition to those, there are some community broadband networks that are all cable or all wireless, um, and we're not really considering those because they're not gigabit capable. Um, there are dark fiber networks where communities own and, and lease dark fiber, usually to businesses, but are not actually providing any sort of service or, or lighting the fiber themselves. There are a lot of municipalities that own networks that serve city offices, or possibly schools, or other public buildings. Um, there are lots of networks in community fiber networks in the planning stages at the moment, some of which will, I think, actually come about, some of which uh, get abandoned during the planning stages. And in addition, there were at least six um, municipal fiber networks that were built uh, over the last decade but have, that have been privatized uh, since then and are now being operated by, uh, owned and operated by, by private, um, private parties. Okay, uh, next slide please. Okay, uh, all right, so which, which municipalities build fiber networks? Um, typically, these are small to mid-sized cities or counties, and the reason is that they're generally small enough to be overlooked by the major providers, but they're big enough to have enough managerial capacity to run, uh, to run the networks. Um, there's a question of how many community networks there are versus how many communities have networks, and there's a lot of confusion here. Um, our list is, when, when I say 136 municipal fiber networks, it's 
that's 136 network projects, but there are actually more communities because a number of them, Utopia being a, a prime example, have um, multiple communities have joined together to own, build and own the network. Uh, EC Fiber in Vermont is another one. Um, in addition, the, um, a, a number of networks that that were built by one community and proved successful are often invited by neighboring communities to expand and so, and so they end up serving four, five, six, eight, ten different uh, communities around them or rural, rural uh, areas nearby. Um, one, one thing I should mention with joint projects uh, is that they can be politically tricky because you have uh, the, the interests of different communities are not always identical, but it does allow you to get economies of scale that you might not get uh, with, a, with a single small community. Um, and then finally, uh, one reason that, that cities choose to build municipal networks is if they already own electric utilities. So by far the um, a great majority Masha, thank you. We, uh, we we lost you for a minute there. Oh, we, go ahead, Masha. Uh, sorry, <laughs> where where did you leave me? Where did I leave off? We, we, you were making some points about uh, uh, the, the, the customers. Uh, you were starting to move to the the next slide about the the many of the cities are electric utilities. Uh, and I think you are about to move to the next slide. Okay. We will move to the next slide. Who are the customers of, of these networks? Okay, more than a third of the community fiber networks we know about are serving businesses, either only businesses or primarily businesses. And that shows the importance of economic development as a driver for building these networks. And it also shows the, the difficulty that businesses in many places experience in getting good, a good and affordable broadband. And it's often the business, local businesses that are the ones agitating for better broadband. Um, a, a few networks serve multifamily housing in addition to businesses, or sometimes residential greenfield developments in addition to business. And then most of the most of them uh, have made it their mission to serve all the residents and businesses in the community, and either they already are or they are in the process of building out to all of those customers or potential customers. Okay, uh, business models. There's a number of successful business models. There is, it's important to realize there is no single right answer. The most common model is that the municipality itself owns the network, operates the network, and provides services. But there are a lot of other options. Okay, one is, uh, one is what's called open access, where you allow multiple retail providers on the system. Um, there's about 30 networks doing that right now. Uh, another option is to um, is to engage a single third-party retail service provider, usually a local telephone company, and there are about 12 networks currently doing that. Um, some cities do not want to even operate the network themselves, and they hire a, a company to operate the network, which may or may not be the same company that's the retail service provider, and there are about 15 networks doing that and there's overlap among 
the, those who contract out retail service provision and those who contract out network operations. Then there's also the 11 networks that I mentioned earlier, uh, where the private operator or another private investor has uh, skin in the game and some, in other words, some amount of ownership and control, not just being hired as a, a service provider. And a few of those, interestingly, are open access as well. So, uh, and among the public-private um, partnerships, I, I would say that no two of them are the same. There's, there's kind of an infinite variety of um, business models that you can, that, that you can use. Okay, pathways to municipal networks. Um, municipal networks tend to get there in a, a couple of common ways. Uh, the most common being if there are existing fiber assets in the town. And the existing fiber assets can come from a municipal institutional network, intel intelligent traffic systems, or any other reason, security systems, any other reason the municipality may have put fiber in. Um, or the municipal electric utility may have put fiber from running from its substations to, um, to, to manage the system or, or put in a smart grid. And, and either of those can be the, form the basis for a, a municipal broadband network. Um, to get from there to a uh, from there to a broadband network, you need to build out to customer premises, and uh, this is often done by adding businesses first, large institutions, especially if they'll pay for their own connections, MDUs, new developments, you get more bang for the buck, and sometimes new developments will pay for their own connections as well. And uh, increasingly common now is to have neighborhoods pre-register as a whole so they can be built out. So that, that's uh, a couple of ways to do that. Okay, obstacles. I uh, should emphasize that most of these obstacles are, are not insuperable, but they are something to be aware of and deal with. So there are legal obstacles, which may vary from uh, minor hurdles to outright bans. Uh, sometimes new restrictions are uh, introduced and imposed during the process of trying to build a municipal network. So it's kind of it's always sort of a shifting uh, battlefield. Um, the political opposition is not always from the state legislature. It's often local as well. Uh, in many towns, you have half of the people saying we need better broadband, let's build it, and the other half of the people saying, no, 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 uh, this is not something that city government should be doing. Um, you can expect competitive response, which is both good and bad, from, uh, from incumbent providers. Um, they can either increase their capacity or reduce their, um, reduce their prices. Um, and finally, uh, an obstacle that you have to think about is uh, usually most cities have a lack of experience as a competitive provider of anything. Even if they have a municipal electric utility, it's usually a monopoly. So, okay, next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so what, one thing we should emphasize is that the great majority of community broadband networks are, in fact, successful. Um, but you need to decide what, what success means, and you have to realize that some of the benefits may be off the books. In other words, wouldn't appear on things that may not appear on a private provider's uh, balance sheet, such as um, cost savings on, on telecommunications for municipal offices or attracting new businesses or keeping young college graduates in town um, or even uh, or even people um, benefiting by uh, the income from providers lowering their prices. Okay, so uh, first thing to do is find out what consumers and businesses want and need. Is there really a need for this network that you're hoping to build? You need to do surveys. 
uh, hold meetings, talk to with community leaders and businesses, and um, very often that is uh, it's necessary to to educate people about what the benefits of better broadband are. People are not always aware how it can help them, uh, how it can help the community. So often um, meetings need to be to be held and educational materials need to be distributed. Um, you need to find out what uh, assets you have in, in the community. Every community has some. It may not just be fiber, it may be real estate, it may be regulations and so forth. Uh, and improve the assets by either laying fiber or conduit, um, implementing dig once policies or finding ways to collaborate with private providers. You want to reach out to private sector partners. Um, if there are willing partners, that can be a lot easier than building it yourself. Um, you also need to uh, treat the network as a, a business and realize that there's going to be ongoing, um, ongoing investments and ongoing management decisions. This is not a one-time thing. Uh, you have to be prepared to do that. And finally, um, I think the most important thing is that uh, community fiber, fiber networks don't automatically and magically create economic development. And you need to coordinate efforts with the economic development agency. Uh, collaborate with them to make sure the network is being leveraged. You need an appropriate development policy that the that the fiber network is part of. You can't just hope that young technology and entrepreneurs are going to show up in town. Uh, resources, the magazine, the conference series, as uh, Drew mentioned, we have a fiber to the home primer, which has been very useful in educating communities that want to get started with fiber. And you can ask me about I don't know. <laughs> Masha, can you hear us? Yes. There you go. Okay, great. Um, do you uh, do you have any uh, additional quick thoughts here as as we uh, conclude uh, your your presentation? I think that was it. I will wait for any questions. What we're going to do, Masha, is we're going to wait uh, for question and answer until we've had all three of our panelists. Uh, please go ahead and uh, say, uh, or I should say, type your question in the queue. We, we, we've got about uh, um, two or three dozen now, uh, so we're going to get through as many as we can, and we're going to group them. Let's go ahead and turn now to our next panelist, uh, David Evertson. David is the CEO of Municipal Solutions which uh, does a, a variety of work in conjunction with more than 300 municipalities and is a three-time former city manager. Uh, and he's joining us from Trinidad and Tobago. So uh, we hope his connection is good and there's good broadband there. Uh, David, go ahead and uh, we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Quick sound check. Everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you very well. All right, first I want to thank uh, David and Drew. Thank you for inviting me to participate on the panel. Uh, the other panelists also thank you for the attendance that are on the, uh, the attendees that are on the call today. Um, if you could go ahead and move to the, the first slide. What, one of the things that I wanted to speak with the, to the attendees about today was confluence. And confluence, so I'll define it a few slides from now. But essentially, um, what I wanted to talk about initially was uh, 
how municipalities can ask the right questions when preparing for wireless internet or, or gigabit networks. And in fact, about um, six or seven years ago, we spoke several times and presented at ICMA and actually wrote an article in their public management magazine regarding uh, these steps. Ten recommendations that will save municipalities a lot of money and a lot of headaches. Rather than go through that because, as you can see on the list of ten items here, there's a lot of work that needs to be done at each step. And so for those that are, go ahead and forward this slide. For those that may not have a gigabit network or that may be on this continuum somewhere or may find themselves at one of these numbers already, I wanted to focus my comments today primarily on recommendation number one um, and uh, provide a little bit more detail on that. But I do have this information available. If someone is interested, it's a great read. There are some stories that will actually make you laugh out loud and shake your head and, and thank uh, your stars that it wasn't you that made that mistake. So um, with that, let's go on to the next slide. And by way of, by way of uh, as, as Drew mentioned, I'm a former three-time city and town manager. One of the challenges that I faced when I was a manager was that I needed to connect my public buildings, but I also needed economic development in my community. And I had the good fortune of working in the private sector and, and working with this technology when it was new, when it was just becoming uh, uh, in, in, its, in its last stages of development, and had the opportunity, opportunity to uh, to deploy these kind of networks before I went back into city management. Previous slide, I was in Bangladesh working with 25 local governments, um, working on an Asian Development Bank project. And standing at the banks of the Padma River, which is the, the, uh, the water that flows from the Himalayas between India and, and Bangladesh, um, the river was so large you literally could not see across it. Uh, of five, six, seven foot waves, ten foot waves at times, and it was such a tremendous river. Uh, most of us that are from the United States have never seen something that big. And it's important to understand that municipal broadband is a lot like the Padma River. It is so big that often you may not know where in that river you are. And so that's why I wanted to start and use the word of confluence as a point of reference as kind of a uh, a North Star as you walk yourself through the process of what you're going to do as a municipality. Next slide, please. Variety of platforms and providers. This slide is a few years old, but it still is illustrative of how technology, media, and telecom are, are merging. And that middle space and that where they're coming together is known as a confluence. Next slide. Here is just one example of a wireless confluence. And how um, different types of Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, satellite dial-up, 3G, 4G, WiMAX, how they all fit into uh, the space we know as wireless. Next slide, please. A few years ago, I was hiking on Camelback Mountain in Phoenix, and I heard a voice behind me. I turned around, and it was Senator John Kyle. And I had spoken to Senator Kyle previously, and he said, you know, hello, hi, how are you? And he said, hey, i got a question for you, if you got a minute. And he said, what's your opinion about Philadelphia? And I said, you mean how many, whether uh, municipalities should uh, enter into the broadband business? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. How many local governments are served by private water companies? He said, well, quite a few. And I said, how many are served by public utility, water utilities? And he said, well, quite a few. And I said, which, uh, which is a better model for local government? And he smiled and said, it depends. And I smiled back and said, well, that's my answer. The primary question is, when, 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 when asked whether a municipality should offer these services, the answer is, it depends. And we're going to talk about those, what some of those uh, reasons and, 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 and uh, decision points are. Next slide, please. The question is whether or not municipal, whether or not broadband is an essential service for your community. 
in the United States, there are 89,000 political subdivisions, and, and that includes, that, that define themselves as local government, cities and towns, counties, school districts, fire districts, etc. Private sector corporations and governments don't speak the same language, for those of you that weren't aware of that. And uh, so the question is, when it comes to a specific defined or undefined geographic area, taking a leadership role in orchestrating success. As you, next slide please. As was illustrated on the previous slide, which we won't go back to, are the essential services that are necessary in your community from education to uh, weather, entertainment, employment, etc. And so the question is, as you move forward, as you're one of the 89,000 political subdivisions in the United States, what is your role? What, if any, leadership role can you take? Next slide. So the municipal broadband alternatives, there are quite a few, actually. Um, the question that a lot of municipalities don't ask is what's the best model for me? The first uh, illustration shows three different models. One that's led by the developer led, one that's technology led, and one that's local government led. And the list is much longer in each of these categories, but it gives you an idea of how, who took the leadership role in each of these municipalities. Next slide. What you see here is the more people that are involved, successfully involved in a broadband initiative, the greater success. It's not linear, it's exponential. And that exponentially exponential success means when you go back to the, the slide, three slides previous, which we won't, education, uh, employment, um, care, all of those factors are multiplied. Next slide. To the degree that as you successfully integrate other stakeholders in your community, the impact is tremendous. So which model enables? It depends. Next slide, please. There's some competing perspectives that have to be mitigated. The federal government, there as you have probably seen in the media from time to time, there's a different perspective between Congress and the administration. That happens at the state level. It also happens at the local government level, we have uh, 35 or 40 municipalities in the city, in the Phoenix metropolitan area, for example. Each of them are going to have somewhat different opinions on things. Private industry as well and consumers. So leadership is critical, and determining a prudent role is the challenge. And I'm going to move through these next slides very quickly so we can give Zane an opportunity to finish and have some really good questions. Local government leadership, there's common mistakes that are made from a limited knowledge of the tech, uh, technology and in the industry, a lack of coordinated planning, missed opportunities, oversimplification, uh, deferring action to another municipality, or we'll let somebody else do it. These mistakes can be, cost, can be costly from the ability to attract and retain businesses, uh, attract and retain people who have and do spend money in your municipality. So how can these mistakes be avoided? This is a, a fun business model that I hope that you will take back and share with your communities and use yourselves. Um, the first question is, is broadband essential? If it's not, stop and focus on other priorities. If it is, you need to ask, are the current capabilities and offerings sufficient? If, they're, if, they, if they are, stop, focus on other priorities. Will the market respond? If yes, stop and focus on other priorities. If the market will not respond, the question, as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, as Shaw mentioned earlier, is, is municipal entry allowed? Is it legally uh, possible for a municipality to enter into this space? And then the final question is, if it is allowed, there needs to be a develop an action plan developed in enabling uh, policies. There's a difference, and I don't have time to, di to discuss it here, but there is a big difference between a cap, an enabler, a facilitator, uh, an infrastructure provider and a service retailer. And those are the possible roles that a municipality can play. But they need to have a, a, a variety of questions answered in order to determine what's prudent. Next slide, please. 
So the five, the, the five steps that need to be done in, initially is some sort of a master planning process where assessments of infrastructure and service levels are provided are, are conducted. Who owns the fiber in your area? What companies? What, what's their cost? What's their access? The surveys, business and residential, are they satisfied with the services? Are they receiving those things that they need at the prices they need? Getting a comprehensive perspective of what broadband is and does and means for your community. Holding a regional summit and a document review of all your existing plans and policies and then developing a strategic action plan. And if you want to move to those slides and wait about five seconds on each, please. These slides represent assessments that were conducted for municipalities where existing fiber, uh, cable, et cetera, was, uh, was identified or not identified summits that were held and who attended, priorities that were established at those summits, and then review. There's a lot of documents within your existing municipality and regional council of governments and regional and state documents that oftentimes conflict and need to be mitigated. So in conclusion, municipality, the municipality as a leader in a community, you need to create confidence. It is important to take a leadership role. If you don't do it, maybe someone else will, but the outcome is something that you can't control at that point. <coughs> Adopt a communications policy master planning process, open dialogue with multiple agencies, evolve your initiatives, don't let them sit on shelves, educate yourself, and actively support legislation. Awesome. Thank you very much, David Evertson. And you know, the, the one thing you, you made in this last part of your presentation was this uh, five-step process of assessment, survey, summits, document review, policy, and strategic action plan. So there's, there's a lot of uh, tools and, and preparation that needs to go into successful uh, municipal networks. As we turn to our final panelist, we want to remind our audience that we are going to have questions and answers. One that we have a lot of is about the value proposition for cities and for municipalities. And so if you don't mind, um, uh, for, our, for our final uh, panelist, Zane Logan, I'd, I'd love to throw that out as a question for you as you begin your remarks. Is, the value proposition for Powell, Wyoming. You're the um, city administrator there. Uh, perhaps you could speak to uh, some of the uh, great things that have gone on uh, in your uh, municipality in regards to broadband. Well, well thank you. Um, just a little bit of background before I get to that so somebody can have kind of a concept of what uh, Powell, Wyoming. We're in the northwest corner of Wyoming, uh, about 75 miles from Yellowstone Park. As you can imagine, it's uh, very sparsely populated, like all of Wyoming is. Um, we uh, are a town of about 6,300, and as the two previous panelists noted, um, we own our own electric. There's a lot of the elements that was uh, said by those two panelists that uh, I could shake my head and smile at as I went along, because that's pretty much what we went through. Um, as I am the city administrator here, um, and in 06, we uh, decided, or I decided that there was an opportunity for Powell. We do own our electric system, and so there was some uh, availability. We rebuilt the whole system so we could do uh, the opportunity of fiber easier than some other communities. Um, I do want to say that we have incumbents providers. A, a lot of places will say, and I know it was mentioned that some of the motivation for uh, fiber systems because they rural rural areas they don't have the opportunities. Well, we had uh, uh, we have um, CenturyLink and I guess it's Charter Communication this month, um, whatever the name is. But uh, they've been here for quite a while, and um, we still I still felt the mayor and council. There again, you got to have the political side. If you don't have the mayor and council in the community, 
even if it isn't visibly behind you, you've got to know that they believe you're doing the right thing. Um, there, as a city administrator, I think the two words I hear the most is economic development. Everybody is doing economic development and everything they do for the community and for the city is economic development. A lot of times that in reality isn't the case. I felt like something just like owning our own um, electric system, owning their own fiber was probably one of the infrastructures. Um, to me, and my mayor and council support this over the years, uh, cities are infrastructures. That's what we do. And I'm sure 50, 60 years ago that some of the city uh, officials were arguing whether they need to spend the money paving the streets instead of getting by with dirt. But I believe that, uh, obviously I don't need to tell this group, that fiber is uh, not only the infrastructure of the future, it's the infrastructure we need now. And so we managed to originally um, do a uh, sell private bonds in investors. Um, and then after the economy in 09, as everybody knows, the recession, our return on our own investments were so low in our enterprise funds that we decided in 2010 to go ahead and the city buy the bonds out. Um, and so we did that. It actually netted us a net return approximately of 6% over what the cost was for the, the previous private investors as well as the low rate of return we were getting on our investments. I, I tell you this because to me it was kind of a no-brainer uh, to do that. Um, as far as measure of success, um, like I said, we and for some references I can't give you a lot of factual numbers and a lot of data that you can write down and, and use, but I will tell you that in 2010, our population was 6,300 when it was done. Before that, we were in uh, 2000, we were 5,300. We were one of the two or three fastest growing communities in Wyoming in that 10-year span. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it was all related because we had the fiber, but I can tell you that we, up to that point, had been losing a lot of the younger people and a lot of the families and one of the things they were trying to do is, is of course retain those and um, I, I think we've seen a turn since 2010 even an improvement in that. Um, economic development I said is always a term that everybody uses. Um, what I have seen though is that what's traditionally happened in most towns is that there's a lot of time and real money spent in romancing that great next company to come to the city and a lot of times, and like in the case of Powell, our neighbor is Cody, we really can't compete. If you're, if you're doing other benefits for trying to attract those companies, we usually spend a lot of time and don't get a lot of production or get a lot of return on that because we don't end up with those companies. My idea was if we wanted people to return or to stay in Powell, we need to offer a telecommunication system that was available at everybody's house, not just at some business park or some downtown areas. And so our system is probably 95% build out to every resident and every address is available. And then of course they have the option of, of choosing that. Um, I will tell you that we feel like our market penetration is well above 35%. I, I really believe we're approaching the 40% mark. And if you recall, I had mentioned that we have incumbent providers and so uh, some notable uh, incumbent providers. So to me, for a town of Powell uh, to get that kind of market uh, penetration already is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, just as economic development is always looking for the next business, I felt like that sometimes that there was some pushback politically or from practical side from existing businesses as well you, the city, are always trying to get somebody new and build the economy. Well, why don't you help the people that are here? And I think that having it to every location and address, I think an infrastructure that does that definitely answers that question. And so I think that's part of the political thing that you need to do is you, it needs to be a benefit. It needs to be a part of the community, just like whether you talk your streets, uh, water, wastewater, it needs to be felt and understood as a, not as a luxury, but as a necessity infrastructure. And one of the things I think is probably a, a Another benefit for power, a factor, is what I call POW pride. I think we take pride in that. Um, we take pride in our community. I know, um, I feel like, for some prejudice as a city administrator, that our community for our size is probably as clean and nice uh, of a place. And 
there is that pride in knowing that we own our own fiber. Um, it, it's good. I know my wife's a teacher, and there's a lot of discussion, and even in that schools districts about the pride and power of owning that. So, these are all things I know that you, it doesn't necessarily make a, a great um, slide presentation, but I think, and I'm, I'm sure that's why I'm on here. Um, it is the, the boots on the ground reality of what you need to do, and there's been a lot of great information. But I think the one thing I say is that there is no one size fits all. The worst thing is not doing something. So, and that's really all I have. So I'll, I know I'll try to keep that short. So, well, we appreciate those those thoughts, and uh, please please stay stay on board here for the next 15 minutes as we go through uh, questions and answers. Um, uh, we've had a, a great interest in this in this webinar. We've had uh, nearly 200 people register for this, and uh, uh, about 140 uh, have been online. And so we, we appreciate your interest in this topic. As I said, this is the first of four webinars that uh, we at Curtin McCon.
will be present on the full webinar when we hear it uh, in recorded mode. So let's just recap once more briefly the points you were making about Massachusetts and the Massachusetts uh, municipal uh, like the district. Sure, and, and so Massachusetts uh, had a, a, a quite a bit of difficulty uh, with municipal broadband until we uncovered a, a, a fairly old and esoteric law where municipalities could establish lighting districts and those lighting districts could provide telecommunications. Uh, and so through that vehicle, um, Massachusetts municipalities now have uh, some capability that they otherwise might not have had. And so the point is, don't despair. Even if your state has prohibitive or, or restrictive laws, let's, uh, let's take a look and analyze those and see if we can find some creative legal workarounds. So David, can you hear us? David Evertson? David Evertson, can you hear us? Okay, we, we can't hear David right now. Um, while we're waiting for David Evertson, David Shaw, do you want to address the question about uh, public-private partners? Yeah, public-private yeah. partnerships. Yeah, I'm, not here. I'm here. Go ahead. Uh, great. David Evertson, would you like to address the question of public-private partnerships? Yeah, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Oh, so the question, one question that lots of individuals have been asking here is, uh, what, uh, what, what are some examples of partnering with public-private uh, sector partners? Uh, could, could you speak about some of the strengths and weaknesses of those? Well, uh, I'm a, first and foremost, I'm a believer that a municipality has a lot of resources available to it, but it doesn't need to look too far outside of its own resources. And one of the things that I would strongly recommend as a municipal manager, you, you know, 20%, up to 20% of a municipality is right-of-way. That's publicly... Design standards that require, and development standards that require uh, co location uh, reduction in uh, traffic flows and costs for curb cuts and what have you. So that's one example. There are other examples such as uh, some municipalities that, that they, I'll give you an example of a small community in Arizona, Superior, Arizona. Superior sits on two OC48 fiber lines that are owned by, uh, th that runs through their community from Phoenix out to eastern Arizona. Unfortunately, they can't get an off-ramp to their community. The equipment costs are too much. And so partnering with other, there, there's been an effort there for, for a few years to get them partnered with other communications providers via microwave, via um, a variety of, of different means, um, and uh, including Intel and other companies that have, that have come in to offer their assistance. So there are quite a number of opportunities to partner, whether it's with wireless, whether it's with fiber, um, where a municipality doesn't necessarily have to be the provider itself, but they can provide incentives, tax abatements, all sorts of things.
Great. Thanks, David. Um, Masha, can you speak to the question of um, public-private partners that you've seen in your surveys? Could you address uh, some of the pros and cons you've seen to that? Uh, yes, there, and as others have pointed out in the articles in our magazine and so forth, there, there, there are a number of trade-offs that you need to consider in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, am I echoing? Go ahead, Masha. Okay. Uh, there are a number of trade-offs that you need to consider in, in terms of control, benefits, costs, risks, and so forth, so that there are many different ways that public-private partnerships can be structured to, um, to have it uh, come out the, the, best, uh, the best way it can be for, the, for what a particular city needs. Um, if a city is more uh, fiscally conservative, you can have the private party take more of the risk. If, if, but that, is, of course, involves losing some degree of control and some degree of, the, of, of benefits as well. So uh, that's why we're seeing so many variations on, um, on the way partnerships are set up, because really the political situation is different in every city. Great. Thank you. Uh, Masha, because of the technical difficulties we experienced here a little bit earlier, we're going to run about 10 minutes longer so we can uh, make time for these questions. We, we do still uh, have many attendees and appreciate those who, who are here with us, so we'll go ahead and uh, do what we can to address these questions. So, so uh, another question you Another question we've had is some of the access some of the models out there, the open access model, uh, the, the the model where where we we're, don't don't use open access, uh, and that's a question that we we've, we've gotten from, um, from from many individuals. Uh, David Shaw, would you like to address that question? What are some of the pros and cons to a municipality choosing the open access model? And then we'll turn to you, Zane, uh, for follow up on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the open access model is. Um, uh, an interesting one. Uh, Utopia is uh, the network most, uh, I think, uh, famous or notorious for it. Um, and the, the gist is that uh, broadband networks are really just infrastructure. Uh, and just as you would not say to um, at, at several companies who wanted to use your uh, highways that they they couldn't drive them unless they owned them. For example, FedEx had to own its own streets. UPS had to own its own. Uh, that, that would be a, a, a strange argument to make in the context of physical transportation. Likewise, in the context of digital transportation, uh, with a, a highway that's big enough, there's no need to have multiple highways. Um, and, and so the concept is, any service provider that wanted to provide any digital service to anybody with a big enough network uh, would have the ability to do so. Uh, and so on the Utopia network today, uh, there are, I believe, some 15 or 17 uh, different service providers. Uh, they don't all provide the same services, but some do compete head to head. Uh, and and uh, likewise, with other open access networks around the country, uh, it really uh, it provides the ability for competition to flourish uh, without the need to tear up the physical streets and roads uh, multiple times. Uh, one final point that I would make on open access uh, is, is that that competitive uh, landscape uh, really does provide uh, a model for innovation in services. Uh, so when we talk about the Internet of Things, uh, that that really does become possible uh, with that sort of an effort. Uh, Zane, would you like to add into that? 
Yes, please. Um, as was mentioned, a POW is an open access, and it was always an open access concept from the beginning. And, and just as David Shaw just said, I think one of the things I would add is for us locally, that's the political leverage you almost have to have. Uh, because when in our case, we had two incumbent providers. And of course, they have a lot of attorneys and a lot of money to come in here at City Hall and the city of Powell and said, you know, these these areas shouldn't do this and compete as government uh, against private. And you, you all know that uh, argument. But when you have an open access and you invite them to be part of it and they choose and you have it in a newspaper and you have all this discussion, having that open access gives you the political horsepower that you need to sometimes get this stuff going too. And it is, to me, the right thing to do because the more providers you have, the more competition and, as Dave said, the more innovation. Zane, we've had a number of questions about some high-level numbers on your uh, economics in Powell, Wyoming. Uh, could you discuss a little bit about number of subscribers, the fees uh, that you could uh, address there? Um, I think we have over total subscribers. We have approximately uh, electric meters. I'm giving you a reference here. So um, we have about 33 to 3,400 electric meters. So that gives you some idea about the number of uh, buildings. Um, we are over 1,000, closer to 1,100 to 1,200 and um, addresses. And of course, some of those are single. We have up to triple play. The city of Powell does not provide the content and, and the service that's done by, uh, they're again a partnership with another ISP in the area, which is TCT West. So, uh, but we have at least, that's where I'm getting a 35%. Um, and if you look at total services, we have close to 1,800. But if you look at addresses, we're in the 1,200 range about right now. And the pricing, uh, Zane? Well, how we do it is um, we don't set any of the service stuff that's done by TCT on the retail end. They pay to the system, which is Powerlink, a WTC or wholesale transport charge. And in round figures, it's about half of the retail cost. Um, there's some package deals and stuff without going all the details. It takes some time. but So basically, uh, we're getting about the about half of the retail cost is given back to the city to, to be able to supply those services over Powell Link, which is our fiber name. Great. We, we continue to get questions here about the open access mo model. Obviously, there's been discussion about Utopia and how Utopia here has been working on a public-private partnership arrangement with uh, Macquarie Capital. Uh, one questioner says, Utopia is in trouble, but is it due to inherent problems with the open access model? or are there ways to do open access right? David. Uh, certainly there are ways to do open access right. Uh, and Utopia's troubles really uh, have generated from its early years um, where it made mistakes and faced the hurdles that candidly no, nobody really anticipated. Uh, and that now in hindsight seem quite obvious. Um, but, uh, but in those early years, uh, it wasn't so obvious. And so a lot of Utopia's pioneering efforts in, in the field of municipal broadband have allowed other networks to avoid those uh, same sorts of uh, pitfalls uh, that uh, Utopia encountered. Um, uh, some of which, uh, again, uh, if Utopia were to start today, it w would not be repeated. Uh, and in fact, in, in recent years, uh, Utopia's efforts have uh, begin to prove more successful at, by being able to avoid those sorts of things. There's a question for Zane here about uh, some utilities hesitant to have their operational equipment running on the same network as commercial traffic. Does your utility still maintain its own network for operation? Uh, and, and, and if not, have you had any reliability issues? Uh, Zane, do you want to address that question? Yes. Um, it was mentioned, I believe, by Masha that uh, some fiber systems were actually the, the city municipal zone. We actually had a fiber system that we had TCT, and that was done in the 90s between all of our satellite departments spread throughout this town. But when we went to Powerlink, all of our services are over Powerlink now. And what we have done is, uh, of course, we own the CO, uh, the hit end stuff, and we have through TCT porting and everything. So our whole 
city infrastructure for billing and all the software, as you can imagine, and all that is done over the, the Powell link and patched through TCT. I don't know all the technicality of that, but it is on the same fiber system, but it's never been an issue whatsoever. Great. We've got a question here about uh, uh, a city uh, due to update um, their general plan uh, through an 18-month process. How can municipal broadband be pursued as part of the general plan? Uh, David Everson, could you address that for us? You bet. We, we were working on a project for a good year, a quick example, a good year. After conducting the infrastructure assessment and the survey and the summit, we did a review of all their internal documents. What we found were things as that there were 16 cell towers that were serving the community, all of course using uh, fiber infrastructure. But those 16 of those 16 towers serving the community, only four of them were located within the city limits. Why? Because the city's general code, general uh, general plan and code required a, min a maximum height restrictions of 80. And when we sat down and we shared with the city planner, with all the department heads, with the planning director, and said, uh, your economic development Often, uh, I was just going to add that often uh, city planners need to be educated about broadband. Not all of them are. We've seen surveys um, in which city planners or many city planners are really sort of unaware of broadband and broadband issues. So that that's just part of a an educational effort that needs to be made. Masha, we've gotten a lot of questions here about communities as small as 6,000. Someone asked about Westminster, Maryland. Um, could you just speak to the size of cities that you found in your survey? Is, is there any kind of discernible trend about uh, smaller versus larger? Could you just speak to that dynamic a little bit? Yes, they uh, tend to be small to mid-size. Obviously, uh, Chattanooga is about the biggest city that, that's um, built a, its own municipal fiber network and they were able to do things on a uh, in, in a much more splashy way and and take advantage of it and and you know publicize it and so forth uh, but there are cities as small as a few thousand people um, that have built successful networks and in some ways it's easier there because uh, because it's a small town where everybody knows each other and everybody can get on board with it and there's uh, there, there's less of a, there's less professional PR to be done. Great, great. Uh, another question we've gotten here about uh, the discussion being focused on U.S. Uh, case studies and models. Uh, what about non-U.S. examples that are that are relevant? And um, let me turn first to David Shaw for that one. Well, so there are a lot of uh, uh, case studies in Europe um, where. Um, Perhaps the scholarship in the area has been more developed uh, than here. Um, there are some case studies also in in Asia as well, but they're not they're not as developed as the European studies, particularly um, in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, Sweden has uh, a lot of work that's been done, um, especially in the dark fiber uh, area. The Stokab network has been around for a long time uh, in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and then also uh, in, in Denmark and Amsterdam, there's been quite a bit of scholarship as well uh, on networks that are fully deployed and operational. So I would encourage you to, to look outside uh, the U.S. towards those models um, for uh, other creative ways to attack this problem. 
We probably have time for, for one or two more questions. One here is about cost and uh, fiber a cost per foot is, is one question that's come up. Uh, uh, who would like to address that one? Uh, uh, this is this is Dave Shaw. I'm happy to take a stab at it. Cost per foot. Um, I'm not as familiar with it as uh, cost per home uh, passed or home connected. Uh, and, and with the direct fiber line on an open access active Ethernet basis, which says a lot about what type of network it might be, uh, the average cost per home uh, passed or four thousand. Not, not a good example of uh, the the infrastructure costs on these projects. Um, but it, there's there's a, a, a mystery. Utah would uh, provide evidence that that's not the case. Uh, that if deployed properly. Uh, an active Ethernet system can actually be cheaper, uh, both in low, middle, and, uh, and high-density housing uh, than GPON systems. We've, we've definitely had a number of questions about the impact of municipal networks on uh, competition in general. And I'm sure we'll be able to uh, address that in our future webinars. Uh, for example, uh, next, next week at this time, we'll be speaking about uh, uh, how to Build Your Gigabit Network, Lessons from Municipal Success Stories, and with Andrew Cohill, Deb Sosia, and Bruce Patterson, I'm sure we'll be able to get to some of those competition issues as well as in future webinars. Um, I'd like to invite each of our uh, three panelists, as well as David and myself, to, to give a quick 30-second uh, summary of uh, any thoughts you have in conclusion, or perhaps with particular reference to this question we've, we've got, which is, what are the features of a successful project? What are the best practices that uh, cities need to have as they, as they uh, get into this space? And let's just go through the order we had, Masha, and then David Evertson, and then Zane, and then we'll wrap up okay. here. So Masha, you have to okay. OK, I would just say that um, having a next generation network is something that every community has to be thinking about. It doesn't have to be one that the community itself builds and owns, but it, it's got to be available uh, to the community if, if business is going to thrive and if people are going to stay there for the long term. Um, that's Great. it. <laughs> that, that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, thought there. David Everton. Yeah, one last thought. As a former city manager, there's not a lot of city managers out there that have a hero complex. What we do have is a very quiet, behind the scenes, pragmatic approach to how can I build a better, how can I put my community in a much better position when I leave than when I arrive. Uh, municipal, that is absolutely at the core of municipal broadband and the potential that it has for communities. And so for those on the call that aren't as familiar with it as they'd like to be. Uh, there are a lot of resources that Dave Shaw, Drew, and uh, myself and our panelists can provide to you. Thank you, David. Uh, Zane, uh, any thoughts on some best practices or key success? Well, um, I guess what I would say to anybody even thinking about this is that the first and foremost, you got to have the political and community buy-in. And you need to make sure that, they, that the community understands that this isn't a luxury infrastructure. This is something that should have been done a long time ago, but you absolutely got to do something, and it should be absolutely part of your community, however you decide to do that. Very good. Uh, David? Yeah, just to wrap up, um, uh, the, the way I see it is uh, in order for you to know whether or not your project has been successful, you need to identify what what you intended success to mean. Uh, a lot of the press out there means that it's a break-even or a profitable project. Um, but that may not be the only key to success in your community. It may mean that you have access to better education or to a, a better workforce uh, or a variety of other factors. Uh, and so, so I would encourage you to identify what is it that you will measure success by before you start the project. Thanks. Um, 
when I uh, wrapped up uh, last year's broadband developments, uh, one thought that I shared was that uh, it, 2014 might go down as a, as a year of uh, community and municipal gigabit uh, broadband. Uh, you know, we used to only see things on the two polar ends, the corporate model where you had an AT&T or Time Warner or, or even, you know, a new entrant like a Google Fiber that has that kind of a uh, exclusive uh, lock on at least their, their wires versus, on the other hand, the municipal uh, retail broadband market where the municipality, uh, because uh, entrants haven't come along, decides to uh, take and, and do some of this on its own. What I think is so fascinating is the, the uh, discussion that's now happening between those two polar opposites. So instead of the corporate model uh, or municipal broadband, you have you know corporate broadband, you have nonprofit and cooperative activities. Cleveland's One Community is a great example of a nonprofit. There's a cooperative. We did have a question on co-ops that I'm sorry we didn't able, weren't able to address during this webinar, but we will come back to that because co-op structure is a great one to use for, uh, for, for many uh, situations. And then, of course, the public-private partnership, which we've seen a lot more discussion of in the past 18 months. There are certain, certain pros and certain cons to that approach, but municipalities that don't have the stomach for the municipal retail broadband may want to actively consider a public-private partnership. So, so that's the, the thought I have is that we're seeing a much more um, nuanced and contextual uh, discussion of municipal broadband. And again, I, I invite you to join us uh, at our next uh, session, How to Build Your Gigabit Networks, Lessons from Municipal Success Stories with Andrew Crowhill, Deb Socia, Bruce Patterson next month. But I want to give next week, excuse me, thank you for correcting me, Next week at the same time, we'll, we'll be returning. We apologize for our technical difficulty a little bit earlier. Thank you for sticking with us. I want to give a real big uh, thank you to Masha Zager, to David Evertson, and to Zane Logan for their uh, involvement. So the webinar now will conclude, and we will see you all. And please share this uh, web address with your friends and colleagues next week at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time on uh, Tuesday, February 3rd. So thank you again, and we'll see you later.